Welcome to our continued study in the book of Acts. In this session, we're going to be in Acts chapter 19. I'm going to be reading uh, primarily from the ESV translation. So I hope you've got your Bible open or you've turned it on on your iPad. Or, uh, but that is the translation that I'll be reading from. I'll read some side scriptures from the New Living Translation. But we're going to be in Acts chapter 19 is where we're going to be picking up. So let me say a, a prayer for us and then we'll dive in. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we come to you in this moment and we are so incredibly thankful for the fact that we have your written word that we can open up to the book of Acts and go to Acts chapter 19 and work our way through uh, this important chapter in scripture. Uh, Father, we thank you for the ability to reason and learn and think and ask questions and wonder and, and have clarification about things. Uh, Father, so many amazing things just through the simple act of reading a chapter from the Bible. So, Father, we ask, as we always ask, may your spirit guide us. May you communicate to us what it is that we need to know, what it is that we need to hear, what it is that we need to feel. Uh, so that we can be better equipped to live the Christian life that you have for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're in Acts chapter 19. Uh, Paul has finished his second missionary journey and now we're, we're getting into his third missionary journey. Uh, and so we're, we're getting close uh, to, to the end of the book of Acts of what we know. Way back when we first started, in the first couple of sessions, if you will remember, I hammered really hard uh, the, that we need to have an understanding that the book of Acts is a history book. It is the only history book in the New Testament. And you have to be very careful when you read a history book not to begin to take your theology or your doctrine from a history book. What Luke is doing with the book of Acts is he is laying out the acts of the early church. He is simply telling us what happened. He is not saying this is what has to continue to happen. He is not saying this is what we should expect to happen. What is he saying? He's just saying this is what happened. So the book of Acts is descriptive. He's describing what happened. It is not prescriptive. Prescriptive is telling us what to do. When we read the book of Ephesians and it says to not gossip or to stay away from uh, immoral behavior, that is telling us what to do. That is prescriptive, okay? When it, when it tells that we're supposed to love our children and treat our wives like the, uh, the bride of Christ and be all of, that's, that's prescriptive. That's not descriptive. The book of Acts is descriptive. Now, why am I reminding us of that before we read Acts chapter 19? Well, as we read through Acts chapter 19, you're going to understand why. Because there are some things here that if you take it as prescriptive, you're going to get in trouble. So we have to take it as descriptive. Okay, so we'll start with verse 1. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, and we talked a lot about Apollos in our last session, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. Now Ephesus is going to really become Paul's home for his third missionary journey. This is where he's, he's going to be based out of. He, he spends two to three years in Ephesus. Now Ephesus is where we get the book of Ephesians. When he writes Ephesians, he's writing to the church that is in Ephesus. Now Ephesus is a, has a, is, a, is a harbor town. At the time in which Paul was there, Ephesus was at its peak. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was booming and going and had all kinds of things going for it. There was a river that flowed into the harbor and that river filled the harbor up with silt. So it came a point when the harbor was of no use. No ships could come in. The trade was cut off and Ephesus dried up. It's almost like it would be not almost. It would be exactly like the town that's booming. And then when the, the gold is gone or the oil is, oil is gone uh, or the interstate comes and, and bypasses the town and it just dries up because there's there's no more commerce. So Ephesus uh, was a booming city at the time. It is not so today. Now, one of the big things that Ephesus was known for is it had the temple of Artemis. The temple of Artemis is a Greek goddess. 
Uh, she was a Greek goddess of wild animals, the hunt, vegetation, chastity, and childbirth. She's the daughter of Zeus. Uh, some people describe her as the Wonder Woman of the ancient world. If you know the, the DC comic Wonder Woman, this is her. If you look up some pictures for Artemis, you'll see a, a goddess, a female with a bow and arrow kind of warrior uh, type uh, goddess. Uh, and there was a temple there that was four times the size of the Parthenon, which is in Athens. Have you ever the pictures of Parthenon? That's a pretty big building. Just think four times that. So this was kind of the, the, the setting of Ephesus. Vibrant city, a lot going for it. Temple of Artemis uh, is what is there. Now, when Paul goes there, uh, he finds some disciples. Verse 2. And then he said to them, Do you receive, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Now, that's an interesting question that Paul would, would ask there, right? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Well, isn't that the way that it is? I mean, don't we know that? Don't we know that when a person surrenders their life to Christ, when we declare and receive the gospel, that part of the whole gospel is my sins are forgiven, my, my sinful nature is crucified, and I receive the resurrected life of Christ with the Holy Spirit. So if that's the case, why is Paul asking these questions? Well, he's asking the question because there had been not so some, some consistent some consistency. We're going to see that in just a little bit. So there is a reason why he's asking. He's also he's not asking because the, does a does a new Christian receive the Holy Spirit? The answer to that question is yes. He's asking to say, have they really had a conversion experience? Have they really come to a saving knowledge of the, the gospel of Jesus? Not just following the Old Testament law. So in, in some ways, he could be asking it this way. Are you Christians or are you just Jews? So when he's asking, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Now, most likely what they're saying there is that they don't understand. We don't understand because even if they would have, uh, they're going to go on and talk about how they were baptized by John, not by John, but John's baptism. And that's, that's pointing to the fact that, that they knew of the Holy Spirit. So it's not a flat uh, question of, they didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. They just, they, they just weren't sure. And then verse 3, he said, And he said, Into what then were you baptized? So now here's his, his follow-up question. They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. So he asked him, Did you receive the Holy Spirit? If they'd have said, Oh, yes. We have received the Holy Spirit. He would have known that they weren't just baptized with the thinking of John the Baptist and a repentance to God that when John was uh, teaching and preaching to Jews. When they said they didn't know about it, then he asked them about the baptism. And, and it becomes even clearer because they say, oh, yeah, we've just. Oh, we were not just we were baptized according to the understanding of what John was preaching and teaching, not John the Baptist. Uh, and that was, uh, they were believing in the repentance only. Uh, this, this aspect of, uh, yes, I need to repent. God is holy. I'm repenting and that's why I am being baptized. It very much had this idea of, of just, I'm trying to get right with God uh, versus I'm in a relationship with him. Trying to get right with God versus having a relationship with him. Now, there's a lot of people in churches today um, that they are seeking to get right with God. They, they're trying to make sure they go to heaven. They don't want to go to hell or they don't want uh, their life to be uncomfortable or not good here. So they're, they're, they're seeking that, but they're not really seeking a relationship with God. They like the idea of God. They like the idea of being in, in, you know, protected by God, 
but are they seeking a relationship with God? And that's very much what these, it seems like that these guys were for, but, but not just that. They, they, they were eager because Paul's drawn to them for some reason. But they had only been baptized with the understanding of John's repentance baptism. They did not have a clear understanding of what it means to be in Christ, to be, have the Holy Spirit, to be pursuing a relationship with God. That's why teaching and discipleship is so important. They were, they were kind of in, but not uh, understanding everything that there was. Verse five, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul baptized them. Now they'd already been baptized. So this is the only time in scripture where we have some people being re-baptized. So they had a baptism with John, but now since they, are, they, since they are giving their life to Christ in the fullness of what the gospel is, they were baptized again. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began to speak tongue in tongues and prophesying. Um, so what's going on with this? So, so we've got these, we, we're going to find out this is about 12 men who Paul runs into. They, he calls them, Luke calls them disciples. Paul asks them, have they received the Holy Spirit? They say no. He then asks them, well, what kind of baptism have you had? They've had John's baptism, which is a anticipatory thing versus a baptism in Christ, which is a fulfillment. So they had been baptized anticipating. And then Paul comes in and, bap and, and baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus. So now they're being baptized with the fulfillment of the gospel. And when that happens, Paul lays his hands on them and they begin to speak. It says that the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began speaking tongues and prophesying. So let's talk about speaking in tongues here. Now, as I'm doing this teaching, we're in the midst of the COVID thing and I'm the only one, I'm literally the only one in the room talking to a camera. Uh, I, 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 this is a time when it would be really nice to have some questions and discussion about this because there's so many different things out there about this. So I will say this, as I say all the time, uh, as the pastor of Anthem Community Church, I am so available to sit and have coffee, sit in a park, uh, talk, or whatever you're comfortable with doing about any questions that you have. So here we go. Tongues. The speaking in tongues, the uh, not a language that you can hear, uh, not a, I mean a language that you can hear, you can hear it, but you can't understand it. It's, 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 it sounds like gibberish. It sounds like, it sounds like nothing. So this is what is going on. They were, prof they were speaking in tongues and they were prophesying. In 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 14, verse 22, this is what Paul says as he's writing to the church in Corinth. He says, so you see that speaking in tongues is a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for the benefit of believers, not unbelievers. Okay, so there's going to be certain things that are in our life. There's going to be certain things as we walk with God. There's going to be certain things that are for non-believers. And there's going to be certain things that are for believers. Now, what does a non-believer need to do? A, a, a non-believer needs to believe. That is the only thing they need to do. It doesn't matter what else they do. If you're a non-believer, you can go to church every Sunday and you can give 10% and you can go on mission trips and you can walk around carrying it. You can sign. You can, do, you, you, you can do whatever, all kinds of things. But if you don't believe, then it doesn't matter. Okay. Now, once you become a Christian, there's going to be certain things for you that aren't necessarily for a non-believer. And Paul is saying, listen, tongues are for the non-believer. It's a sign. Now, remember, this is the beginning of the New Testament church. This is the beginning of a brand new religion. What is it? What is it about? Is this true? Is this Jesus? Was Jesus God? Did he raise again from the dead? Did he send his Holy Spirit? There's all kinds of questions. This is so different for these people. This is, this is, this is not even out of right field. This is beyond out of right field. So there has to be some examples, some signs for them. And, and 
Paul lets us know that that is what is happening here. Now, this is a recording of what happened. This is not telling us this is what's supposed to happen. So what some people have done is they've said, OK, once you're baptized, you need to have people lay their hands on you so that you can receive the Holy Spirit. And the only way that you can know that you receive the Holy Spirit is if you speak in tongues. That is incredibly poor theology. In fact, it's not biblical. OK, it doesn't line up with all of the other things that were taught. Did it happen in this particular place, in this particular chapter in the book of Acts? Yes, it is descriptive. It is not prescriptive. And if you take this event and make it prescriptive, you are in trouble. OK, to say that the only way you know that someone's received the Holy Spirit is if they've spoken in tongues is not biblical. That's not true. It is not solid theology. It is what happened here. And that's what we know. Uh, we have multiple times in the book of Acts where the with the receiving of the Holy Spirit. And it does not follow a set pattern. OK, in chapter 10, verse 44, it came to believers before they were baptized. They spoke in tongues, then they were baptized. And Acts chapter 8, 12 through 16, if we looked at it was at the time of. They received the Holy Spirit at the time they believed. In what we've just read in chapter 19, verse 6, it's after. Uh, and in 8, 17 and in 19, 6, it involved the laying on of hands. And other times it didn't lay. It didn't involve the laying on of hands. So y you need to understand that there is no formula. If you've, if you've heard me teach very much or been around my teaching very much, you know that I say this a lot. God loves variety. And somebody else's story is not your story. And if you try to chase somebody else's story, you're going to be in trouble. Comparison will kill your soul. And God, the Christian life's not a formula. There's some basic things. But after that, there's not a formula. And when you try to make Christianity a formula, you're going to get in trouble. Because it's not a formula. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 verse 9 says this. Um, I think I got the wrong verse. Maybe let me see if I transpose that. 9, 8. Nope. Well, I don't. Somewhere in here, <laughs> there is a verse. Paul says that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a Christian. And that's what I'm trying to look for. And I don't know where I, I wrote that down on my apologies. Well, let me just read Romans 8, 9. This is what Romans 8 says. That's the way. Uh, let me see. Yeah, no, that's not helpful. Sorry. I don't know what. No, that's bugging me. Is it bugging you? It's bugging me. That if we don't have the Holy Spirit, I don't have anything with me to look that up. So, well, if you know what that verse is, you could holler it out and we all won't hear you. But anyway, uh, we know from other passages of Scripture, and it's pretty clear, that if you do not have the Holy Spirit, then you're not a Christian. So having a, when, once you become a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. And what's the point of me trying to say, what I'm trying to say there is this idea that, oh, I believe and oh, I've been baptized and now I've got to wait for somebody to pray over me or to lay their hands on me for receive the Holy Spirit. And the only way to know that I've received the Holy Spirit is if I speak in tongues. Please don't believe that. This is just not what scripture teaches. It is what happens here. But there's other things that happened in other places in, in Acts that you don't want to have any part of either. And so we just have to understand that. So, so why? why? Why would it be this way? Why, why, why isn't it just set and it's just the same for everybody? Well, I, I don't know. That's just the way that God does it. But one of the things that we do need to keep in mind here is this, is this is a transitional time. We are tra this, it's, it's, it's a transitional time. So we just don't know, you know, it's like, well, this is happening and this is happening. We're not sure about this. And we're not sure about this. It's, it's very similar to COVID. Remember back in the spring that this is I'm recording this in January of 2021. 
Back in the spring of 2020, remember when everything was being wiped down and everything had to be disinfected and, and the whole deal? And then it was like masks didn't help and then masks did help and then it was only for only helped you from getting it and or giving it to others and didn't keep you from getting it. I mean, it, it's changed, right? We're going to look back at this, this COVID-19 virus in two or three years, and we're going to have a much clearer picture of what it was and what it wasn't. But in the midst of it, it's all over the place. And that's been frustra frustrating, right? Because you don't, you don't, we don't know. Well, the book of Acts is this transition time. I mean, we're talking just a few years of this, not that far from the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came the first time. So they're, they're figuring it out. Um, so that's, ho hopefully that didn't confuse you too much. And like I said, we can go have a cup of coffee or sit at the park and talk if you want, if you want to have some more conversation about that. Uh, verse says, verse uh, seven says there were about 12 men in all. And, and as far as we can tell, some people will take that and make it about the 12 tribes of G uh, Israel and the, uh, most likely it's just, it's, that's it, there because there were about 12 men and that's, that's, that's what it was. Verse eight, and he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly. Well, we can stop right there. We know why he entered the synagogue. We've been talking about that session after session after session. He spoke in this particular synagogue for three months. Okay, three months, no problems. Three months, no riots. Three months, no threats. Three months, no beatings. Three months, not taken to the court. Three, three months. He's reasoning. He's persuading them about the kingdom of God. Okay, which includes the gospel of Jesus. Okay. So this is what reasoning, persuading. Reasoning, persuading. You want to share your faith? You got to learn how to reason and persuade. You got to have to have, you're going to have to have, learn how to have a conversation. Can't get bent out of shape just because somebody disagrees with you. you. You can't cut somebody off just because they offend you. You can't just dump and leave somebody. I think the term that people call it now is ghosting. You just ghost somebody. You just disappear because it didn't go your way. You're not going to ever do anything. You're not ever going to make a difference in this world with that. You're also not ever going to have any real friends. Reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way. Now, what is the way? Well, the way in Acts a, f a few times is a phrase that Luke uses to describe Christians, like the Christians. This is the way we live. This is the way we are. This is the Jesus way. So they were stubborn and continued in unbelief, and they begin to speak evil of the Christian way before the congregation. He withdrew from them and took his disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannius. Uh, so they started to get all bothered about what was going. So he left the synagogue and went to this, to the hall of Tyrannius. Now, who was this guy? Well, uh, th th he had built this giant lecture hall. It was pretty much open daily from, the, from what we can tell from about 11 to four. And people would go in and they would have lectures and they would have learning and they would have teaching. And uh, seems like he may have been a Jewish man. And it really kind of operated as a private synagogue. So there was the synagogue, the official synagogue. And then this was kind of uh, brought over to be the private synagogue. You know, and where I'm from in the south, there's in a lot of towns, there's a first Baptist church and there's a second Baptist church. Uh, and the people who were in the second Baptist church used to go to the first Baptist church <laughs> and they had some problem or whatever. And now there's a first Baptist church and a second Baptist church. Uh, so that could very similarly be, he's like, I'm done with the synagogue thing. I don't want, so he, he, he did his own thing and, and people use that. So that's where Paul goes to continue his reasoning. This continued for two years. Okay, so again, Paul's here for a while. So that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord both Jews and Greeks. Okay, so Paul is having, a, you know, his teaching and the more and more people that come to Christ, the more and more people who are baptized, the more and more people who have, are coming to Christ and receiving the Holy Spirit, they're going out on their day-to-day -day lives. They're going out on their business trip. They're going out on their trade. They're sharing what is happening and, and Christianity is spreading and it's spreading beyond just the places that uh, Paul is in and beyond just the synagogue that he's talking in. 
we know this is the longest period that he stayed anywhere in these missionary journeys. And this area really is the west coast of modern day Turkey. There's three churches that are in here. Uh, the church where the, we get the book of Colossians written to, Laodicea, and then Herapolis, which I, I, I have a hard time saying. Some scholars believe that the seven churches that are in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ, that all seven of those churches are in this area that is being mentioned here. But we know for sure three. Um, so, Things are happening. Uh, God's moving. Verse 11. And God was doing extra, extra, extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Um, this we know. We know that people were being healed. We know that people were being raised from the dead. We know that demons were being cast out. We know that miraculous things were happening. Now we're about to see some of this stuff that's happening. And this is descriptive this is not prescriptive now before i read verse 12 i want us to be reminded of something when you take the scriptures and look at the scripture you look at the old testament and the new testament sometimes we begin to think that 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 every book and every story and every character has all of these miraculous things happen in their life and that's not true the bulk of the miracles the supernatural things that happen in the Bible are around Exodus, around the Exodus uh, leaving Egypt to go to the promised land, around the life of Christ, obviously, and in the early workings of the New Testament church. You take someone like Joseph from the Old Testament, no miracles in his life. King David, not a single supernatural miracle in the story of King David. Or Solomon. So, or Esther. Uh, uh, you know, so you can just you can just keep you can keep going and, and find in a lot of people that that's just not that's not the case. So here's verse 12. And it's a bit weird. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. So even if Paul touched something, he used a, a handkerchief. They didn't have Kleenexes back then. He used a handkerchief or he had an apron on for his work or whatever. People would take that and take that and touch other people. And then they would, they would be healed of their sicknesses and their disease left them. And even, even, even evil spirits came out of them. Now, I can't explain that. All I can tell you is Luke said that's what happened. And according to Luke, that's what happened. Now, is that supposed to be happening today? Well, it can happen if God wants it to happen, but I've never experienced that. I've never heard anybody that's even experienced that. Um, you got to be careful. This is descriptive, not prescriptive. He mentions evil spirit. It's kind of a bridge into what is about to happen, about what we're going to be discussing here. Verse 13, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I drew you by the, by the Jesus from whom Paul proclaimed. So what is happening here? So you've got some exorcists. You've got some, uh, well, you've got some exorcists. <laughs> and they are, they're like, oh, look, look what is happening. This Paul guy is all these things. People are getting healed and demons are leaving. And so it's like, we're going, we're going to use this Jesus person that Paul is talking about so that it will benefit what we're doing. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Scivia were doing this. So they were using the name of Jesus, even though they didn't believe in Jesus. But the evil spirits answered them. Jesus, I know. They have to listen. We have to read this carefully and slowly. Here's what the evil spirit, when they invoked the name of Jesus as non-believers. This is what the evil spirits responded with. Jesus, I know. Paul, I recognize, but who are you? <laughs> now, for some of us, we can't get past the fact that there's an evil spirit. And then there's other of us can't get past the fact that an evil spirit would be speaking. Okay, But once you get past those two things, I believe in evil spirits. I believe in demonic. I believe in all that. Why? Because it's in the Bible. Jesus believed it. <laughs> it's too many, too many places for it not to be there, for it not to be true. This is how he answered, Jesus I know, Paul I recognized, and who are you? So th that's, that's pretty interesting um, that it would be like that. 
there is a theme in the book of Acts that lets us know that Christ has victory over the occult and over the demonic. We've seen it in multiple places. We'll continue to see it as we study. We have dominion over evil spirits. They do not have dominion over us. Will they attack? Yes. Can they make life miserable? Yes. But they cannot control us and they cannot take our joy. They cannot take our love. They cannot take our peace. And they certainly cannot take our, our salvation. We have victory over that. And, they, and it's just so, Jesus, I know. I know Jesus. Paul, I recognize. Who are you? Um, so, you know, some takeaways there. Demons are real. They can communicate. Um, and they are powerless against Jesus. They are powerless against Jesus. And the men in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them. And the man in whom the evil spirit leaped on them. So the man, they were trying to cast the demons out by using the name of Jesus, even though they didn't believe. And there were seven of them. Okay. And they were trying to free this man from the demon. Then this man jumped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Now that's, that's a whooping. <laughs> that's a whooping. When one guy beats up seven guys and those seven guys run away naked. <laughs> okay, that's, that's, that's Chuck Norris right there. I mean, they, 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 he went Chuck Norris on them. He, he, all right. So, and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus. I would think so. <laughs> that, that would uh, uh, that would that would get around um, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Okay. So Paul, Paul uses a handkerchief, and God uses that handkerchief to deliver someone. Somebody taking the name of Jesus out of context, somebody taking the name of Jesus and doesn't know him, goes to one man, seven of them, they get their rear ends kicked and have to run away naked. Jesus has been glorified. Jesus has been extolled. So there is no exorcism that happened there. Uh, they just got, they got, they beat up and left. Verse 18, also many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. Uh, so there are people who are involved in the occult. There's people who are doing things. Um, reading certain books, uh, doing the horoscope, doing the palm reading, doing the whatever it is that they're doing. And, and they're, they're, they're who were now believers. They had become believers. They'd received the Holy Spirit. And now they're divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts before brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they continued, counted the value of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. We don't really know how much that is. We just know that was a lot. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. So you have people's lives being changed is, is really the, the take, take away from that. That it was resulted, that there was a result was from fear. They're fearful of what is going on, but it's a proper fear. It's a fear that God is God and we are not. And, and Jesus is a deliverer. Uh, and that's going to involve confession and repentance. And so we see that there. So now we move to, to verse 21. Uh, a riot in Ephesus. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Uh, so Paul is 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 going, OK, I've, I, I, I need to go. Uh, there's places I need to go. Uh, his his ultimate goal is Rome and Spain. Now, Luke doesn't talk about Spain here, but. His ultimate goal was to get to Rome. Why Rome? Rome was in New York City of the day. Rome is the most popular city in the world, the most powerful city in the world. If you can make it in Rome, you can make it anywhere kind of deal. That's, that's what Rome is. And so Paul's trying to get to Rome. Now he's going to go to Jerusalem because uh, still Jerusalem has a special place, obviously, for all kinds of reasons. Um, but he is on the way there. And he's going to go through these other places. And what is he doing there? As he goes through these other cities that he's already been and where churches have already been planted. He wants to confirm the churches. He wants to encourage them. Do you need any encouragement? I certainly do. 
And so that's one of the reasons we gather uh, for worship. That's one of the reasons we do things like this. To be, we do this for, to, for learning and knowledge, but also to be encouraged. For us to be encouraged to what it is that, that we need to be doing. Uh, and he also probably would have been receiving uh, finances. He would have been going and asking for offering and asking for people to help at, um, with their ministry and with their missionary uh, travelings. Because obviously it would be super expensive today. It was ex ex super expensive back then. Um, verse 22, And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. So he's got, he's got his team of people, Silas and Timothy and others, and he divides them up and, and, and sometimes he stays here and he goes there and he sends them there and they do that. So they're dividing and conquering. That's what they're doing. Verse 23, about that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. And that's just the way being another way about the Christians. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, Remember the, the goddess, the hunter and the uh, all of that goddess person brought no little business to the craftsman. So this craftsman is making idols of the goddess and he's selling them. OK, he's, he's making stuff for the temples. He's making stuff for people to stay at home because this is his livelihood. This is how he makes money. These he gathered together and the workmen in similar trades and said, man, men, you know that from this business, we have our wealth. So and this is how we make our money. And you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people saying that God's made with hands are not God's. So what, what is happening here? These guys are looking at the message of Paul and is seeing people come to Christ. They no longer need their idols. So their business is drying up and they're looking at us and say, well, if, if if this continues and people continue to turn and we don't need, they don't need us. We're out of business. We don't have a way to make a, a living. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into uh, disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Ar Artemis may be counted as nothing and that she may even be disposed from her magnif magnificence, 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 magnificence. She whom all Asia and the world worship. So let's just, just pretend. Let's just, or let's imagine. So many people in America come to Christ. So many people in America repent of their lifestyles that don't honor God. That it began to impact how many people came to Las Vegas and did all of the things that Las Vegas is known for. Would that get anybody's attention? Yes. That's what's happening here. Okay. Um, there's in the book of Acts, there's two times Gentiles opposed Paul and his teaching. The everybody else was Jews. Two times. We've already looked at one. This is the second one. They were both over money. They're both over money. Uh, you really want to start Messing with somebody, you mess with the money. You know that. Um, verse 28. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with, with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel, travel. So they grabbed a couple of people. They went into this theater. This theater would have could seat about 25,000 people. We don't know if 25,000 people were in there, but we know that there was a large group. Uh, but when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the, so however you say that, who were friends of his sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now, now, so they've grabbed these people. They've went in. They're, they're causing a riot. They're, they're coming against the teaching of the gospel. Paul's, Paul's ready to go in the theater. Doesn't that sound like Paul? That sounds like Paul. Yeah, I don't care. It's 25,000. I'll go in. Let's go. His friends came around him. His other believers came around him and said, no, we're going to protect you. You can't do that. Uh, and, and he did not go in. Now, some cried out one thing. Uh, now, some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion. And most of them did not know why they had come together. 
See, human nature has not changed, has it? You see all these people marching and for stuff, and, and, and I've, I've watched some of them. They get on the streets, and they, they walk up to someone and say, so, hey, so why are you here, and what, what's the, you know, what are you standing for, and do you know this, and do you know that? And they don't even know. They don't even know why they're there. They can't even give a definition of, of words that explain why they're there. The same thing, and most of them did not know why they'd come. They'd just gotten together. They'd just gotten together with a mob. It's like, we're going we're gonna to beat some people up. Uh, we're going to do something. Uh, some of the crowds, uh, some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward. And Alexander, motioning with his hands, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great as Art Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of Eph Ephesians uh, is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky. Now listen to this. Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. So what is this guy saying? He's going, do you believe what you believe or do you not believe what you believe? Do you believe Artemis is that great? Do you believe that she is a goddess? Well, if you believe that, why do you think they can take, take her down? That's a good question, isn't it? Do you believe Jesus is Lord? Do you believe that God's on his throne? Do you believe he's in control? Why are you in such angst? That's a good question, isn't it? Here, this pagan man, this non-believer, is going, listen. If our God is so great, then what are we worried about? For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. In other words, they haven't done saying anything about our God. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there uh, are counsel. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it should be settled in the regular assembly, for we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today. Rome did not like rioting, and if you didn't get it, if this leader allowed this to happen, he would be held accountable for it. Oh my goodness, does that sound familiar? We are really in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. There is no cause for this. We're not going to have it. We're not, this is not what we're going to do. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. And so they went about their business. Um, our God is not a man-made God. So why are you worried? Why am I worried? Do I really believe? Do I really believe what I believe? It's an important question. It really is. Acts 19. It's an interesting chapter, isn't it? It involves uh, speaking in tongues. Uh, it involves people who believed but hadn't received the Holy Spirit. It involves uh, healing handkerchiefs, uh, uh, demon possession, uh, uh, an attack on, on seven men. It involves uh, almost a riot. Uh, all involves uh, where the role of that money really plays in our lives. It is a it's a it's a it's an interesting chapter in the book of Acts, and it's a great chapter to uh, highlight that when we read a history book like the book of Acts, it is descriptive, not prescriptive. There's obviously all kinds of things that we can learn from it, all kinds of things that we can take away from it, but in the end, it's it's Luke telling us what happened in the early parts and during the time that Paul was in Ephesus in his third missionary journey. Well, obviously, uh, we'll dive into Acts chapter 20 for our next session. Uh, hope you're doing well. Hope you continue to do well. Uh, so you can read ahead and uh, we will uh, tackle Acts chapter 20 uh, next time. We'll see you soon.